Okay, so we've been talking about our first order neurons and their organization in the periphery and just a little bit about their organization as they enter the central nervous system. We're going to devote an entire tutorial to following the pathway by which the first order neuron eventually communicates with higher structures in the forebrain. So we won't look at those details now, but I do want to jump to identifying what are those centers that are involved in processing mechanosensation in the forebrain and give you just a little bit about their physiology. So let's begin with talking about the somatic sensory division of the thalamus. So there's a brief tutorial that talks about the thalamus to get you oriented to this part of the forebrain. For now, I'll just remind you that the thalamus is derived from the diencephalon, which is part of the forebrain of the prosencephalon, and it's the more dorsal posterior part of the diencephalon, with the hypothalamus being more ventral and anterior. Well, the thalamus, as my other tutorial goes into in more detail, is divided into a number of nuclei, and those nuclei relate to a particular part of the cerebral cortex. So if we were to look at the cerebral cortex, uh, we could identify just about any region that we may decide to poke at and ask what is the thalamic nucleus that projects to this region of the cerebral cortex and and we'll have a different answer for most different sites in the cerebral mantle that we might uh, inquire about. Well if we focus on the postcentral gyrus which is right here that's as we'll talk about in just a moment is our primary somatic sensory cortex, there's a particular part of the thalamus that maintains interconnections with this postcentral gyrus. That part is exactly the part of the thalamus that receives the ascending information about mechanosensation. That part is what we might call the somatic sensory thalamus, and we have some anatomical names to give it. We call it the ventral posterior complex of the thalamus. And that ventral posterior complex is divided into two main nuclei. There's a division called the ventral posterior lateral nucleus and a division called the ventral posterior medial nucleus. And the division there basically reflects the terminations of our um, pairs of pathways that are representing the body from the posterior part of the head on down and then a different pathway conveying mechanosensation for the face. So for the body below the back of the head, we have signals arriving in the ventral posterior lateral nucleus. Whereas signals concerning mechanosensory activation of facial structures arrive in our ventral posterior medial nucleus. So now we're ready to consider what happens to this somatic sensory information as the thalamus uh, communicates it up to the level of the cerebral cortex. And that gets us into our postcentral gyrus. So here once again is the postcentral gyrus in my model of the human brain here. And this is where we're going to find the region of cortex that we call the primary somatic sensory cortex. The reason why it's primary is that it's the first part of the cortex to receive input about mechanosensory information and in anatomical terms it's the part of the cortex that receives input from the somatic sensory thalamus that is the ventral posterior lateral and ventral posterior medial nuclei and as we'll see the ventral posterior lateral nucleus projects from the paracentral lobule in the midline of the hemisphere along this postcentral gyrus as it extends across the dorsal and lateral aspects of the cerebral hemisphere until we get to about two-thirds the distance between the midline and the lateral fissure. When we get to about this region, now the rest of the postcentral gyrus is receiving input not from the VPL, but from the VPM, the ventral posterior medial nucleus. This explains why in the mapping of the body that we'll, we will see in just a moment, there's a disjunction between the representation of the hand and the representation of the face. It's basically the boundary between the projection zone from the VPL and the VPM. Okay, well let's look at this now in a bit more detail.
So here we have an illustration from your text, which shows us our primary somatic sensory cortex, which we call S1 for short. So it's found in the postcentral gyrus, and it's comprised of four cytoarchitectonically distinct regions of the human brain that Corbinian Broadman named over 100 years ago areas 2, 1, and area 3. And workers after Broadman subdivided area 3 into an area 3A and an area 3B. So from posterior to anterior, there are areas 2, 1, 3B, and then 3A, right at the depth of the central sulcus. So in each of these cortical areas, we have a complete representation of the opposite side of the body. And that representation is beautifully mapped out. We call this somatotopy, which means body mapping. And the way the body mapping works is that the distal part of the lower extremity is represented in the midline, right at the medial termination of the postcentral gyrus in this region that we call the paracentral lobule. So this is essentially where we find the representation of the contralateral foot. And as we progress over the dorsal rim of the hemisphere and onto the dorsolateral surface of the postcentral gyrus, the body map progresses from the foot up the lower extremity and then into the region of the trunk. And then from the region of the trunk, we encounter the shoulder, and then we get into the upper extremity. And where the central sulcus has a fairly distinctive curve in it, that's the region where we find an expansive representation of the contralateral hand. Now, notice we have not yet encountered the face. That's because, as I just mentioned, the face is conveyed by inputs from the ventral posterior medial nucleus of the thalamus, which terminates in this inferior segment of the postcentral gyrus. So just below this S-shaped bend in the central sulcus, we have a junction between the representation of the hand and the representation of the face. The illustration that we have in front of us shows us the detail of that body mapping, and it truly is an exquisite mapping of the body with the progression from lower extremity through the upper extremity, and then a disjunction where we then have a break and the representation of the face in the inferior third or so of the postcentral gyrus. Now, there's a wonderful story about uh, a famous neurosurgeon at the Montreal Neurological Institute, Wilder Penfield, and his assistant. And um, there's some discussion as to how much of this is really true or not, but evidently the assistant is the one that suggested to Dr. Penfield that this distorted representation of the human body be represented in a simple cartoon. And so that's the cartoon that we see here in panel C. This is called the little man, or the homunculus. And this is an illustration you've probably seen before. It's intended to communicate the idea that in the postcentral gyri, taking the two hemispheres together, we have a complete representation of the body. But that representation is distorted. Those body parts that uh, provide us with the greatest spatial acuity and the greatest sensitivity to mechanosensory stimuli are hugely represented in the brain. And they're represented uh, in these distinctive features of the postcentral gyrus. The hands are represented where the central sulcus has that S shape, where the two gyri interdigitate against each other, and then the face is represented in that inferior segment of the postcentral gyrus whereas the remaining parts of the body are not nearly as magnified. We call this phenomenon cortical magnification, which has to do with how much more does cortical circuitry magnify the representation of the body that's otherwise related to the density of peripheral receptors and the density of neurons at all the antecedent stations in the somatic sensory pathway. Well, the upshot here is that the homunculus makes very clear 
that the important somatic sensory surfaces for us as humans would be our hands and our face, especially the facial structures around the mouth and the tips of our fingers. Now before we leave the primary somatic sensory cortex, I do just want to comment on the functions of these four parallel body maps. You, you may find that curious, and frankly, uh, a lot of us find it somewhat curious, but there do seem to be distinctive receptive field properties that are represented in these four different maps of the body. Um, one might suggest that area three, being subdivided into 3A and 3B, uh, is truly the primary somatic sensory cortex from a physiological perspective, whereas areas one and two seem to process a more higher uh, order aspect of somatic sensation. Uh, area 3A is especially concerned with our proprioceptors, uh, those receptors that are found in deeper structures, such as our muscle spindles and our Golgi tendon organs and our joint receptors, whereas area 3B is more concerned with cutaneous receptors. So area 3B is more uh, cutaneous, is going to be more concerned with light touch, for example, than the movements of our muscles and joints. Now once we get into areas 1 and 2, we're encountering more complex aspects of somatic sensory processing. Uh, area 1, for example, is going to respond to complex stimuli activating multiple skin surfaces, for example, over uh, multiple fingertips, and perhaps uh, responding selectively to a particular pattern of motion, our fingers passing over a counter surface from left to right, for example. Area 2 seems to be concerned more so with the shapes of objects that we encounter. So it suggests that there's some kind of computation of lower level signals into more higher order signals that begin to build up a sense of structure in our somatic sensory uh, interactions with the world. Okay, and so finally let's consider what happens to this information beyond the primary somatic sensory cortex. What we discover is that the primary somatic sensory cortex uh, being at this level here has extensive interconnections with other parts of the brain. Uh, there is something that we recognize as a secondary somatic sensory cortex that is in the inferior and posterior uh, aspect of the parietal lobe, perhaps also involving the posterior aspect of the insula. And this secondary somatic sensory cortex receives input from our primary areas. And from there, that information is further elaborated in a higher order sort of way and passed into structures in the medial part of the temporal lobe that are going to be important for making memories and for interacting with our emotional networks. So that involves the hippocampus and the amygdala, respectively. Areas 1 and 2 uh, likewise project into our secondary somatic sensory cortex but area two in particular, the one concerned with more complex geometrical aspects of somatic sensation, projects into parts of the parietal lobe that sit just posterior to it in the superior parietal lobule. And these parts of the parietal cortex seem to be especially concerned with our orientation relative to the environment. So there's a, a spatial uh, mapping that's going on here in this part of the brain, and that mapping is used to drive our motor system to interact with the world in appropriate ways. So for example, imagining a visually guided reach. That is a means of directing our somatic sensory surfaces towards a particular goal. Well, uh, that's going to be integrated through parietal and frontal networks, most likely involving this superior parietal lobule region. Okay. Well, this has been a very quick sense of cortical processing in the somatic sensory system. There are so many big questions that we've yet to address, such as how does perception actually work? How is it that we can have, for example, the integrated sensation that one might experience when holding a snowball or an ice cube or maybe uh, immersing a finger in a cup of tea uh, Consider those experiences. We're combining a sensation of shape with structure, 
with a sense of texture and a sense of temperature and just maybe a sense of pain as well. Uh, I've been emphasizing the concept of labeled lines and parallel processing, but at some point in our perception, we unite these labeled lines into a solitary percept. And it's still not clear to neuroscientists how that unity of representation occurs. There may not be an anatomical explanation for that perceptual sense of unity. There may be other physiological means to build up that percept, and this is all under active investigation. So hopefully this tutorial has given you a framework for understanding how mechanosensation works, and um, will also help you to put the anatomical pieces together when we look in a different tutorial in detail at the organization of the somatic sensory pathways. So I'll see you then when we consider that interesting anatomy that gets us from skin to cortex. Well, finally, before I leave you in this tutorial, I want to suggest a, a study question that begins to apply this knowledge in the clinical domain. I want you to consider what would happen if a patient were to suffer a stroke involving the middle cerebral artery. And I want you to think about such a stroke occurring in the right hemisphere. Okay, now I'm giving you a bunch of options to think through, and they all begin with this word anesthesia. And uh, anesthesia implies lack of somatic sensory sensation, particularly in the domain of mechanosensation. So consider these options and go ahead and indicate um, in one form or another what you consider to be the best choice among this set of options. I'll see you next time.